This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust. A message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I'm at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts, downtown Moscow. And look at this monumental door behind me. It's a replica of a huge bronze door from Florence, Italy, and these doors were called the Gates of Paradise. But when you look closely, these doors are covered with the faces of prophets. Prophets, many, many, many prophets. You know, when you come to the New Testament, we find that prophets were still operative. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, Christ gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, and they're to be in the church until the end of the church age. And when you review the book of Acts, you find the book of Acts is filled with prophetic activity. For example, in Acts chapter 11, there was a whole group of prophets traveling with one prophet named Agabus. When you come to Acts chapter 13, you find again a whole group of prophets. When you come to Acts chapter 21, you find Agabus shows up again. And once again, he's traveling with a whole group of prophets. So it was not unusual to encounter a prophet in the New Testament. And of course not, because Christ gave the gift of the prophet to the church. And until the church reaches maturity, the prophet is needed. God is speaking. He's speaking through prophets to anyone who has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Christ gave the gift of prophet to the church. And today, we're going to dig deep and find out how many New Testament prophets are actually referred to in the New Testament. But first, watch this. 30 years in the making, Rick Renner's new book, Apostles and Prophets, is being called Essential Teaching for Every Believer. And now, this book is available anywhere books are sold or online at renner.org. This beautifully bound 750-page book is the definitive study available on Apostles and Prophets. When you call or go online today and get Apostles and Prophets, you'll learn how this essential teaching has been overlooked in the modern church and why it's important for every believer to understand the Bible's definition of these roles. This book lays a biblical, spiritual, intellectual, and historical foundation to the words Apostle and Prophet. And I believe this book will biblically give you what you need to understand the roles of these gifts in the end time church. Through its detailed information, Apostles and Prophets allows you to have correct apostolic vision for the church as it is laid out in the New Testament, and that we biblically understand the roles of Apostles and Prophets and how they are to function in these last days. Through beautiful illustration and detailed descriptions, you'll see what it was like in the early church and how early church leaders operated within these ministry gifts and will make this book a treasure for you and your family for years to come. Call now to get Apostles and Prophets for just $30 or go to renner.org. Great as a gift or for your own Bible study. Don't miss this special offer. My friend, I really want you to order my book, Apostles and Prophets. The subtitle says their roles in the past, in the present, and in the last days. I've been teaching this book in these programs, but today and tomorrow is the last day which we're offering the book. So if you want to order it, please go online or give us a call to place your order. And remember that we're offering you this series by the same title called Apostles and Prophets. It's 15 parts and it's based on these programs. There's no way you can remember everything I've been covering in these programs because they have been so jam-packed with information and revelation about apostles and prophets. So please order the series so you can see it or hear it again. And remember that it comes with a study guide so that you can really get all this teaching down deep inside you. And my friends, when you reach out to us, always remember that we at Renner Ministries want to pray for you. In fact, you really can't get away from us without being prayed for. We are praying people. And if there's anything heavy on your heart or that you're facing and you just wish there was somebody who could pray with you, well, here we are. Give us a call. Send us an email, go online, and the moment we hear from you, 
We're going to agree with you in prayer and Jesus is really going to do something spectacular. But hey, yesterday we looked at what and who were intertestamental prophets and thank you for your response. I'm so appreciative when you reach out and let me know that the program is feeding you. But today we're going to move on and we're going to see how many New Testament prophets are actually referred to in the New Testament. And of course, I'm teaching from my new book, Apostles and Prophets. I can't teach all of this because it's so enormous. That's why I want you to get your own copy of it. But the word prophet today is wrongly used very often in the church. And I'm sure that if the Apostle Paul were alive today and he saw the growing list of people who are called prophets, and you can see them in magazines, on television, and the internet, and all kinds of media, if he saw the growing list of people who identify themselves as prophets or who are incorrectly called prophets by others, I think he would simply be aghast. At the time of the New Testament was being written to the church, it was being established, the word prophet was a very important word. It was a respected term that was only applied to those who were bona fide, Christ-given prophetic gifts. And today this word is being used very, very loosely. And the problem is, when you use a word too loosely, you water down the meaning of the word. And the truth is many have a drawing to prophetic things, but that does not make them a Christ-given prophet. Many people have a drawing to help churches get started, but that does not make them apostles. Many people have a deep, deep love for the lost. That does not make them a five-fold evangelist. Many people have a deep love for people and want to really care for people's souls, but that does not make them a five-fold pastor. Many people love the Word of God and even to share insights from the Word of God, but that alone does not qualify them to be a five-fold teacher. Prophets are real and prophets are powerful, but only a handful of those that are called prophets really are prophets. And I'm convinced that people who use this term wrongly or who incorrectly use the term prophet to describe somebody else simply do it because they really don't understand what the word prophet means. That's why we really need to understand this subject. But words and terms are very, very important. And when a very specific term like the word prophet is used too freely or too loosely, it gives the false impression that there's a plethora of prophets in the body of Christ. And my friends, there simply are not. But in this program today, we're going to be looking at New Testament prophets. And the list I'm going to give you today is not all inclusive because there were traveling groups of prophets. We really don't know all of their names. We know some prophets that are named in the New Testament. And today we're going to be looking at some of them. And you're going to see that there were local prophets. There were traveling prophets. There were some apostles who were also prophets. There were female prophets. And you're going to see that in the early ages, just like today, there was a problem with false prophets. And in tomorrow's program, we're going to be dealing with the issue about false prophets. But when we come to Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we find that in the city of Antioch, there was a hub of prophetic activity, and it was amazing. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible tells us, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. But notice verse 1 begins with the word now. And in Greek, it is the little preposition day, which is an exclamation mark to make a powerful and dramatic statement. You could actually translate the verse like this. Now, amazingly, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. And then it gives the list of these men. And Acts 10, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, does not specify exactly who were prophets and who were teachers. But when you read the Greek text, the Greek text uses certain parts of speech to indicate the first three were the prophets and the last two were the teachers. And this would mean Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene functioned primarily as prophets, while Manian and Saul functioned in Antioch primarily as 
teachers. But when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, Paul tells us that eventually his calling expanded. And of course, we know that he was an apostle. And when you're an apostle, you have the ability to function in all five of the fivefold ministry gifts. And when you read Paul's wording in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, it seems that he indeed functioned as a prophet as well. He says, whereunto I'm appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And Paul here says he was a preacher. And there are some scholars who allege that this word preacher refers to Paul standing in the office of a prophet. So if we stopped here, already in the New Testament, we would have Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, and the Apostle Paul as individuals who functioned as prophets in the time of the New Testament. But then we come to another very powerful example in Acts chapter 11, a man named Agabus, another example of a New Testament prophet. This is prophet number five. And in Acts chapter 11, we're told that a prophet named Agabus arrived in Antioch from Jerusalem with a whole group of unnamed prophets. So in addition to him, there were other prophets that were traveling with him. This entire group of prophets were endowed with remarkable prophetic insight concerning future events and with the power of explaining divine mysteries. And we read in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 28. And in these days came prophets, notice it's plural, prophets, from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth or a famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. But that word signified really means to signify, to give a sign, or to give an alert. And it pictures a dramatic foretelling of a coming event. And in this case, it was a dramatic warning of a famine that was going to come to the entire civilized world or the Roman Empire at that time. But notice it says that Agabus gave his prophetic alert by the Spirit, which is a translation of the Greek word dia. And this little word dia can be translated through the Spirit or by the Spirit. It conveys the idea of instrumentality or agency. And here we find that Agabus was empowered to speak by the agency of the Spirit or by the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. And Agabus, as a prophet, which we saw in a previous program, was one who had learned to hoist his spiritual sails. So the moment the Holy Spirit was ready to move, his sails his prophetic sails were ready to catch the movement of the Spirit. And because his spiritual sails were hoisted, he was prepared and caught the wind of the Spirit in his prophetic sails, and he was propelled to supernaturally foretell a coming event which really took place during the reign of Claudius Caesar. And the believers in Antioch took this so seriously that they took up a big offering, and they were prepared for this event. But then we come to more prophets that are in the New Testament, and there's a group of them, four of them, which is going to bring the total to nine. And this is in Acts chapter 21, where we read about Philip's four daughters who prophesied. This was Philip the evangelist. He was one of the original seven deacons who became an evangelist. But when we come to Acts chapter 21, verses 8 through 10, the Bible says in verse 8, and the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. I can't even imagine how excited they must have been to be staying in the house of one of the first seven deacons and how they must have shared experiences and shared memories with each other. But verse 9 says, And the same man, that's Philip the evangelist, had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. But notice it says, and the same man. The word and is a translation of the preposition day, which is an exclamation mark to make a powerful and dramatic statement. You could translate it now amazingly. You could translate it categorically, emphatically. This man had four daughters who did prophesy. And the use of this little preposition day indicates these daughters were emphatically recognized and well-known for their prophetic giftings 
as five-fold prophetesses, four girls, the daughters of Philip the Evangelist. That is amazing to me. And really, this should challenge anyone who would ever suggest that Paul's writings are opposed to women being in the ministry. In fact, nothing in this passage suggests that Paul or any of his companions had any problem with recognizing these were four Christ-given, five-fold ministry prophets living in this house, and they were women. These four daughters were just as recognized as prophetesses as their father was recognized as being a five-fold evangelist. And then as we go further in the New Testament, we find another event where the same Agabus shows up again. And we read about this in Acts 21, verse 10. The Bible says, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Here comes Agabus again. Like metal attracted to a magnet, Agabus felt a spiritual connection to Philip's household where there were four resident prophetesses. My friends, if you study the Old and the New Testament, you find that prophets were always attracted to each other. They knew where each other lived. They traveled in groups. They were always visiting with each other. And now in that very same style, we find that Agabus, he knows that in this particular house, there's not just an evangelist. There are four prophetesses, and he's attracted to them like metal to a magnet. And now he shows up, and he comes to the house of Philip the evangelist. There is no indication in the Bible at all that he even knew the Apostle Paul was there. There's no indication that he came there to give the Apostle Paul a word, but when he got there, suddenly the Spirit of God began to move. And we read in Acts chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, and bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When Agabus came into that house and saw Paul, suddenly he was moved by the Holy Spirit to deliver a prophetic word. His spiritual sails were hoisted. He was ready for any moment the Spirit wanted to move, and now he's moving under divine inspiration, and he begins to foretell future events that are going to take place with the Apostle Paul. But notice, Paul and his companions had already been in that same house many days with Philip the Evangelist and four daughters who were prophetesses. And there's no indication in the Scripture at all that in the many days they were there, the four prophetesses ever gave any indication that trouble was awaiting Paul in Jerusalem. I'm sure they shared many things. They probably shared many prophetic things. But it seems that this particular aspect of Paul's future was not revealed until Agabus showed up. Now, why would these four girls be with Paul for many days and not see what Agabus saw? And the answer is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, where the Apostle Paul says... Let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. If anything be revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one that you all may learn and may all be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Notice in this verse, the word prophets is plural again and again and again, which means in the city of Corinth, there was a multiple group of prophets that were functioning. And we also find in this verse that no prophet has all the revelation by himself. God speaks through many. And the four daughters of Philip were bona fide prophetesses and likely had shared many prophetic insights with the Apostle Paul in the many days that he had been there in that house with them. But when Agabus arrived, just like this verse says, they held their peace and made space for another prophet to operate. And he divinely began to share what had not been revealed to them, which means no prophet knows and sees at all. We need a lot of prophetic ministry to see the whole counsel of God. But wait, there's more. The Bible also tells us about the prophets Silas and Judas, which would make number 10 and number 11. We read this in Acts 15, verses 22, 30, and 32. The Bible says, 
Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, Judas and Silas being prophets themselves. So according to this verse, these two men were prophets, but wait, there's more. We know that in the church of Thessalonica, there also were prophets, and those particular prophets were making a prophetic mess that the Apostle Paul had to straighten out. That's why he wrote to the church and said, quench not the spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, he says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. He gave them instruction about how to deal with right and wrong prophetic ministry. But then we also find there were prophets who prophesied over Timothy at the time of his ordination. We read this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went on before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, he refers to that event again when he says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, and with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, prophets were present when Timothy was ordained. We don't know their names, but they were there and they were prophetically functioning. Then finally, we come to the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 11, we find there will be two end time prophets who will be so supernatural energized by the power of God that no one will be able to stand against them until the beast kills them, after which their bodies will be displayed in the streets for three days. And on the third day, they'll be raised from the dead and they will ascend into heaven and the whole world will see this event take place. But if you put all of this together, we have the 11 specific names of prophets plus a whole company of other prophets that were active during the time of the New Testament. My friends, prophetic ministry is real. God has given the gift of the prophet to the church. We just need to understand who they are and who they are not. And that leads us to tomorrow's program where we're going to be talking about how to recognize a false prophet. It's going to be good and it's important. So don't miss tomorrow. But I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. These days, a lot of people are being called apostles or prophets. But are real apostles and prophets still alive, well, and operating in the body of Christ today? In this much-needed, powerful series, Apostles and Prophets, Rick Renner covers what an apostle is and what an apostle is not. What are the signs of a true apostle? Why would anyone claim to be an apostle if he wasn't an apostle? What does the word prophet really mean? What do we know about how real prophets do and do not operate? What about false prophets? This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. And right now, we urge you to get Rick's new book, Apostles and Prophets, their roles in the past, the present, and the last days, with over 700 pages of information to help fortify a solid foundation underneath your life for the special introductory price of $30. Joseph Z, founder of Z Ministries and best-selling author, says, armed with his Bible, historical examples, and decades of tenured experience, Rick has produced a scholarly masterpiece that will right-size the mania, purge the dysfunction, confront willful ignorance, and cause celebration among the lovers of the Word of God. And Flashpoint host Gene Bailey says, this is not a stuffy manual on how to be an apostle or prophet. You will want to keep this book nearby the next time a question arises on the subject of apostles and prophets. Don't miss this exciting offer, the 15-part series, Apostles and Prophets, and the insightful and penetrating book, Apostles and Prophets. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and today I am standing in the foyer of Rick Renner Ministries in Tulsa, Oklahoma and I just wish I could pick you up and bring you here to see all the wonderful ministry that is happening in this facility where we receive thousands and thousands of phone calls from people just like you who reach out to us for prayer and for teaching they can trust. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And we know that's our job. Our job is to feed many. And I wanna say thank you to you for everything you've helped us do with your giving. You helped us construct our studio, purchase this building. And now in phase three of our ministry expansion program, we're wanting to pay this facility off so we can liberate all that money 
to take the teaching of the Bible around the world on additional channels and venues. And by being a part of our giving team, you can really help us make this happen. If you're not already a part of our giving team, please pray about joining us. And together we can join hands and through teaching of the Bible and by ministering to people that reach out to us and by sending teaching products around the world, we can really change people's lives. And it's amazing to me that today it's never been easier to make an impact in somebody else's life right from where you are. So thank you for praying about being a part of our giving team. And the moment you join, I want you to really expect the power of God to show up in your life. I want to remind you to order my series called Apostles and Prophets, The Roles in the Past, Present, and Last Days Church. It's 15 parts based on these programs, and it comes with a study guide. My friends, these programs have simply been jam-packed. I know you cannot possibly remember everything that we've covered, but it's revelation that you need to get down deep inside you, and that's why I want you to order the series and the study guide. And tomorrow will be the last day which we're offering the book called Apostles and Prophets, Their Roles in the Past, in the Present, and in the Last Days. Look at that book. And my friends, in the very center of this book, there's a full color illustrated section which will help you understand everything that you're reading in this book. You will devour this. It will be a resource that you will go to again and again. And I would encourage you to order two because you're going to want to share one of those copies with your pastor. He will simply thank you for getting him this gift. But I want to pray for you. And remember that tomorrow we're going to be talking about how to recognize a false prophet. But Father, we thank you that the Word of God gives us discernment. In these last days, we need discernment. We need to be able to recognize who is an apostle, who is not, who is a prophet, who is not, Help us to learn who really is, appreciate them, and embrace them so we can receive your ministry to the church and to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow, but remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Hey friends, we're coming to an area near you, and we want to invite you to come to one of our meetings. Sunday, February 5th, we're going to church for all nations, in Colorado Springs, and we will be with pastors Mark and Linda Coward. Then on Sunday, February 12th, we're going to be at Legacy Church with Pastor Jeremy and Sarah Pearsons in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. Then on Thursday, February 16th, Denise is having a women's meeting at the Stony Creek Hotel in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. On Saturday and Sunday, February 18th and 19th, we're going to be at the Living Word Christian Center with Pastor Mac Hammond in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And on Sunday, February 26th, we're going to be at Faith Family Church with Pastors Michael and Vicki Bang in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But please go to our website to affirm all these times and all these dates, and we look forward to seeing you there. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.